We are one. We are one. We are all one in God. We are love. We are love. We are all the love of God. Beauty. Surrounds me, falling at my feet as I. We are strength. We are all the strength of God. Beauty surrounds me. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Unity of Bellevue, where our mission is to awaken people to their spiritual nature and to transform the world. In doing so, we honor many names to God, the many and diverse paths to God, and the many ways that people worship God. Whether I see your radiant faces here in the sanctuary, and it's great to see so many faces here in the sanctuary. Oh, to the microphone up, um, or we know that you're connecting with us online. Know that we're very delighted to have you here to, this morning, and we are blessed by your presence, and we celebrate your oneness. My name is Ken McClellan. It's my privilege to get things started this morning. Uh, also included in our all-star team this morning, I want to first uh, just mention our, our speaker, guest speaker this morning is Michael Bogar. You're going to hear pro Michael's uh, full, full bio shortly, but seeing Michael there just kind of reminded me, Michael's been a special friend of Unity of Bellevue for, we were trying to recall this morning, probably at least 20 years that he's either been a guest speaker or taught classes. Um, I've attended many of his classes uh, going back at least 20 years. I remember taking a comparative religion class from him back in during that time period. More recently here, he's taught um, the Metaphysical Bible and Souls Code He's terrific. Over the years, I've personally become a Michael Bogar groupie. In other words, if, if he's teaching, I'm attending, and you'll be lifted by, uh, by his message. For guest musicians today, we're especially blessed to have Laura Berman coming to us virtually from, I believe, her cabin in Colorado. Laura has also has a long history with Unity of Bellevue, and her music is always beautiful and inspiring. 
The other members I want to recognize of our uh, team this morning include our meditation leader, who is Jennifer Holt. Our prayer chaplain is also Jennifer Holt. Our board host is Kathy Bostetter, and our offering steward is Paul Roof. I also want to thank our team of volunteers, the greeters who met you when you came through the door, our ushers, and our hospitality team who provided coffee and tea for you in the friendship room. And at this time, I want to give kind of a special shout out to uh, Linda Hillesheim and Rita Schwarting. If, I hope you were here yes, last week for the Easter service. If you were not, the floral decorations were fantastic. Both, thank you. Uh, Linda and Rita were responsible for those. I noticed a lot of those have kind of moved on, a lot of the Easter lilies and the azaleas. But the place was filled with uh, hydrangeas, lilies, hostas, geraniums, et cetera. So I tried to capture a couple of them in pictures, but um, most of them have moved on. But really, thank you. I think they did a terrific job. And now, let's get the celebration service started and kicked off with Laura Berman with our community song. <laughs> so we'll just we'll just do a couple of verses a cappella while they figure out the sound. Does that sound okay? Do you guys up in the sound booth? Okay. We'll just do a couple of verses of up up up, okay? So um, Well, you guys get to see me in my jean day. <laughs> All right. Why don't we stand up? You want to sing with me? All right. Up, up to a higher place. Up, 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 far beyond this time and space. Up, up, up to a higher place. I feel my soul rising to a higher place. A higher place, higher place. I feel my soul rising to a higher place. Up, up, up to a higher place. Up, up, up far beyond this time and space. Up, up, up to a higher place. I feel my soul rising to a higher place. Higher place. Higher place, I feel my soul rising to a higher place. No higher place, higher place, I feel my soul rising to a higher place. No more forward. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> We call forth, we invoke divine good. We open to all that is being gifted to us. In this moment, knowing we are always creating 
and always bringing into our deepest desires. We align our deepest desires again with the highest and the best good, and we allow the divine to flow through us as us, to be us. We breathe in with a sacred breath. Breathing in peace, we breathe in again. We declare the sanctuary, this community, this celebration, this service is so sacred and we are grateful and so it is. I guess while we're still sorting out the audio, let me move on to our invocation for this morning. Our invocation for this morning is, I will affirm with my whole being that I can always rise. I am ready and willing to receive the grace and power and to be more of who I am. I release my, any resistance I have to embracing the new and the bold. As I rise, I lift others with me knowing the beloved community is coming into being through me and through us all, and so it is. Would you all repeat that with me, please? Even those of you online, I dare you to go ahead and say it out loud. There's great power in the spoken word, okay? I affirm with my whole being that I can always rise. I am ready and willing to receive the grace and the power to be more of who I am. I release any resistance I have to embracing the new and the bold. As I rise, I lift others with me, knowing the beloved community is coming into being through me and through us all, and so it is. Good morning, my name is Monica McDowell Elvig. I'm your center administrator. I'm also um, temporary operations manager while we're in this time of transition. Isn't it great to have uh, more volunteer leaders helping to lead our service? Ken and Dixie. Uh, it's been very fun to have all of you and your souls and your personalities up here helping to lead. Uh, I'm going to read uh, Reverend Michael's bio. We had um, an introduction to some of his classes, but uh, I thought I would read a little bit more that he uh, has on his website. Michael's approach is from a full life experience, and thus he can relate to a wide range of people. He has a way of communicating to those at the top of their game and those ready to quit. Life is educational. Each morning presents an opportunity to begin anew. He has taught at the graduate and the undergraduate levels and has a proven ability to inform and inspire students ranging from the informal beginner to the serious scholar. Reverend Michael has a lot of degrees <laughs> and he integrates mythology, theology, personal spirituality, practical philosophy, and depth psychology. He combines deep scholarship, spontaneous humor, and contagious enthusiasm with a down-to-earth practical approach to personal and spiritual growth. We are so grateful you are with us again this morning. I, you bless us with your presence and your robust intellect always feeds us um, heart, mind, and soul. So thank you for being with us. Our reading uh, for this morning comes from our book of the month, The Selected Poems of Wendell Berry. He's a farmer and an activist, uh, poet, and um, on this special Earth Day Sunday, I'm going to read excerpts from his manifesto, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front and the First Amendment. Listen with your heart. Friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love God, love the world, Love someone who does not deserve it. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. 
say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the mold. Call that profit. Prophesy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. Go with your love to the fields. Lie easy in the shade. Rest your head in her lap. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. To be sane in a mad time is bad for the brain, worse for the heart. The world is a holy vision, had we the clarity to see it. Practice resurrection. We give thanks for this word. Right before liftoff, what was once light and airy can't catch my breath. Pour sweet canary for the weight on my body. Oh, break me, take me, climb inside. Bring me to a new divide, and I will go.
will fly high. That was an abrupt ending. Good morning. And thank you, Ken, for the kind words, and Monica. Um, I don't consider myself an academic. Um, I've done a lot of studying, but my life is as effed up as anybody else's. <laughs> and I'm not saying that to um, put me in any place, but just to let you know that my desire this morning is to share a message that is, is important to me and might be important to you. And this image up here sort of summarizes the idea, and we're going to get into this in some detail in a minute here. But this, the lowercase i is intentional and the uppercase. And here the idea is something that came to me a, a year or so, or actually 10 years or so ago, that maybe, maybe we are each more than a single person that we are a little I, we call it the ego. Ego is the Greek word for I. But I'm suggesting that we may be more than just the little ego that we see ourselves to be down here on this earth, and that maybe there is a sort of super self. One of the reasons we like comic books is we, there's always Clark Kent, but Clark Kent is also Superman, Bruce Wayne, Batman, and all of the other characters, females and males. The idea being that there seems to be something in human consciousness that knows we are more than just this little I, and we are connected to something that is a bigger I. Now, the first thing I want to say is do not believe a word I'm saying today, okay? Because I'm not giving you the truth. I come from an evangelical background, left that movement as a movement about almost 30 years ago, but I still love many of the people in that movement, and I still love, I love a lot of the ideas in that movement. The reason I came over and, and gravitated toward new thought is they allowed me to engage imagination. And by imagination, I don't mean making things up. I mean it in the sense of C.S. Lewis saying that there are two paths to truth with a capital T. The one is the empirical observation we call science. We can experiment using our five senses, and we've seen that in spades with this COVID thing. But, and this is a neglected area, I think, in our culture, C.S. Lewis says we also have, from the infinite one, from the divine, from God, imagination, where the images, the eternal images, come into our consciousness and are, uh, allow us to move toward the truth through imagination. I think that's why, come on, Einstein has this famous quote. I don't have my remote with me today, so. He said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. So what I'm saying is this idea I want to share with you today is not science. I'm, I'm, I can't prove this. I'm going to use some evidence, I think, that hints toward this idea of a higher I and a lower I. But this is not science. It's imagination. And Lewis suggests that we have a part of our consciousness that is able to connect to the infinite through the infinite images. We call them archetypes. That there are patterns of consciousness. And Einstein saw this in physics. Not only was he a mathematician who could empirically sit down and write these equations to prove quantum physics and all the other stuff that he worked in, he said the ideas came to him as a little kid through his imagination when he watched his mother turn on a light and he wondered if he had a surfboard and could be sitting on that surfboard when the light switch came on, how long it would take him to surf across, surf across the room on the light wave. Now, that's not the sort of thing most people sit around and think about. <laughs> that's imagination. And then he set out to see if there was evidence for it. Bill Gates, when he was a little boy, used to watch Star Trek. And on Star Trek, he would see Captain Kirk sit at his desk and have that little laptop computer back in the 60s. And Bill Gates said, someday, I'm going to grow up and make one of those. 
That's imagination. Gene Roddenberry imagined the possibility of this little tiny computer, and, and Bill Gates came along and empirically, scientifically, made it real, or at least materially real, you understand? So what I'm saying this morning is this idea I'm sharing with you is coming from the imaginal side. That's why I'm asking you, don't believe a word I say. Try this on. One of the reasons I like the New Thought Movement is because it allows us to try some ideas on. I believe it's actually more biblical. Because when you read the Apostle Paul talking to the Corinthian church, he says that you have various gifts of the Spirit, and one of them is imagination. And imagination has to be discerned. That is, people have to come around and say, you know, that's an interesting image that you're creating with your imagination there, but I think it's a pile of crap. And sometimes they are, yes? But they may also say, you know, that's really an interesting idea. I want to try this on and see if it, how it fits my life. So let's go there. Let's look at this idea of the two eyes. And here's the basic idea. I think we are all sp psycho-spiritual schizophrenics. What's schizophrenia mean? Split mind, two minds. So I, I, I'm, this, ha this actually, the idea came to me several years ago when uh, Sherelle and I were living on a houseboat in, in West Lake, and I was standing at the sink doing some dishes, and this little ant crawled out of nowhere across the side of the counter and went down, and I just intuitively went... <laughs> And the minute I did it, I thought, that ant wasn't bothering me. Why did I kill that little ant? And the thought popped into my mind, and this is how imagination works. And it was as if the ant had a voice all of a sudden. And the ant said, don't worry too much about it. We are just probes for the archie ant. <laughs> In other words, antism, or the, the prototype of antism is pre-exist pre before the little ants come into material form. That's very New Thoughtish thinking. But it was astonishing because I thought, is that true? The ant, actually the voice said, I am merely a probe for the archi ant. I thought, isn't that interesting? And this is Rupert Sheldrake, the British phys physicist who talks about morphogenetic fields. The idea that each, everything in the universe, let's look at humans right now, is surrounded by a kind of field. We know magnetic fields, it's in this room right now, the magnetic field is here, and you know it when. How do you, how do you, how can I prove to you there's a magnetic field in this, coming through this room? Compass. Right? You get a compass and you see that little needle moving around and it, goes and points to the source of that field. So what I'm suggesting is that maybe, just maybe, and again, don't believe this, maybe each of us is a little probe, that we are little tiny incarnated or embodied mm, individuals in this earth school coming from the archi self. Do you understand? Archetype, original patterns. What if each of us is an archetypal pattern of consciousness? Carl Jung called it the higher self. That each of us is a higher self. And that is why we are schizophrenic. Because in any given situation, we look at life through one set of eyes that is in this lower material, lowercase i realm, and we see that situation and we evaluate it based on circumstances and situation. Somebody's screwing me over. And have you ever been betrayed by a loved one, by a family member? Or... I'm going through an experience of that right now in my own life where a family member, it's not my wife, it's an other family member, but someone who I really didn't suspect would ever try to cut me, just totally, completely cut me off um, financial, in a financial situation. The finances are a great, great way to challenge that little ego because a little ego looks at this, the situation and says, well, if I don't have that, then I can't have this, and if I can't have this, then this, and we can spin ourselves down into those places where we go to bed at night and we lie there and we hate and we, oh, why is my life so hard? Did you ever go through any of that? That's the little I. All it can see is this perspective, and maybe that's all there is. I'm willing to, if somebody says to me, well, that's all there is, I say, okay. But what if 
That little eye is only one perspective, and the reason we have this kind of spiritual schizophrenia is because there's something in most of us that knows when that little eye is in a state of fear, chaos, panic, desperation, despair, and depression, and all that stuff that comes with that limited perspective, there's oftentimes a little voice that says, well, maybe this isn't true. Maybe you're just fine. Oh, you don't understand. I have so many years on me, and I have only so much time to make money, and I need yada, yada, yada. And we, you, you all understand what I'm talking about? What if the reason we have two voices is because of this? Let me give you an example here. The little eye is terrified of the fickleness of existence. You know what I mean by that? The fickleness of existence. You never know from one day to the next what might come into your life that completely takes everything out from underneath you. This mind, this ego my little ego, wants situational peace. Do you understand what I mean by situational peace? I want the circumstances to be such that I can be peaceful automatically. Everything's going fine situationally, therefore I have peace. That's the little I, the little ego lives that way. I have happiness based on the situation. I have joy based on the situation. I have success based on the situation. And this little I is terrified and opposed to any threat of those experiences that make me peaceful, happy, and joyful. We will kill people that come to us and try to take that out of our life situationally. That little I, person said to me not many years ago, a sponsor I had through 12-step work, said, Michael, when you live in that ego, the little self, if you continue to spiral down into it, you eventually will become homicidal or suicidal. Because you start feeling like, if I could just get rid of that person, or I can't kill them, well then kill yourself. And most of us in this room, if we're honest, have had that thought at times. Maybe not like seriously, but the thought, the, it rolls over us and says, if you weren't alive, you wouldn't have these worries. Yes? Do you ever? All right. So this little I, this mind worries, grieves, panics, is depressed, self-obsessed, self-obsessed, self-obsessed. <laughs> Did I say self-obsessed? <laughs> and always waiting for the next disaster to, to occur. That's what this little ego mind does. It's situationally happy, but it's waiting. And it knows, as the Buddha said, this life is dukkha. That's his first principle. The Buddha's teaching is that this life is suffering. The word dukkha in uh, the, the, that language is a cart losing a wheel. And that's the way it feels, doesn't it? We're rolling along just fine on four frickin' wheels, and all of a sudden we get a phone call or a situation, a, a doctor's report, or whatever it happens to be, and the wheel falls off the cart. And it's like, God, I was moving along so good until this hit. That's the little I. And we all know this experience because it is human. When we turn on the news now, if you have over the last few weeks and seen what's going on in Ukraine, a country very much like our own in so many ways, and all of a sudden you have people living in normal, happy, situational lives, displaced with family members being killed and, and entire cities being destroyed. And if you're like me, there's a part of you that goes, could that happen here? Of course it could. That's the situational eye, and we live in it. But I'm suggesting in this weird, imaginal idea, that there is a greater I as well that we are probes for. That the greater I hovers over and around this fickle situational I and whispers, rest, period. But you can't, I can't rest. You don't understand my situation. I understand your situation. You're a probe. And I'm not minimizing this life. This can be very wonderful, and it is. But there are times it's like, why? I used to have a boss when I was doing construction work, framing houses many years ago. And every morning we'd roll out in the rainy, cold weather in Washington about 7 o'clock in the morning. And inevitably, sometime in that first half hour, I would hear him holler at the top of his lungs, the boss, Why? First time it scared the hell out of me. I thought, What's, what happened? And then he'd always say it three times, why, why, why? 
Is life so hard? <laughs> That's the situational little lowercase I, but what if the higher I, we often call it God, and I'm not denying God, but I'm wondering if maybe we have missed a mediator in between. Usually we talk about I, situational little case I, related to infinite God. But this scenario says, and it's, we'll see in a moment, it's in all the world's religions and all the mythologies and in modern science brain study with the two hemispheres. What if there is a middle person that is me, but it's the higher me? It's not Michael. Michael is this little incarnation here now in this life, probing and getting experiences Marriage and divorce, having children, losing children, having jobs, making money, losing money, losing jobs. All these experiences we all go through and that this little probe is having these experiences which are being assimilated into the higher self, the higher I that's saying, keep going, someday we're going to get together and you'll understand how all of this works. But in the meantime, it whispers, rest. These painful situations come and go. Every situation, every painful emotion and traumatic thought is purposeful and temporary. That takes faith. Now, really? All the world's religions, and I don't have time to get into this in a lot of detail, but I'd love to do a class on this sometime. This idea is found in the world religions and modern science. You find it in Chinese Taoism. How many of you have heard of the Tao Te Ching? Does anybody know what each of those three words or pictographs in Chinese stand for? Tao, the infinite one, the I am. De is the little manifestations of the infinite one, the I am. Jing is classic. So you can read that title this way. This is a classic text on the infinite I am and all of its little I am's. You find it in Hinduism or Buddhism. In Buddhism, which has a very deep psychology, suggests that we are ahamkara, which is really just a ego making. It's the little I. And in Buddhism, the goal is not to um, grow a bigger I. It is to get rid of this I. And it doesn't really say what's happening in the Buddha mind. But it's two minds. Every human has two minds. Hinduism makes it very clear. The Bhagavad Gita says, your soul is your greatest enemy and your greatest ally. Isn't that interesting? And the idea is that there is an Atman or a soul or a self that is the lower self. And that little self in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna and Krishna are talking as uh, Arjuna, a general, is going into battle and says, I don't want to kill my relatives. I know they're doing evil things, but I don't want to be a warrior and kill them. And Krishna says, you're not killing them. That little pro body is going to die someday. What Last after that is the larger or the higher Atman. So you find it there. You find it in ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, when they wrapped the mummy and put the mummy in the tomb, they believed that there are at least two parts to the soul of every person, actually six parts, but we'll only look at two. The Egyptians said there is the Ka part or the Ba part of the soul. And that is the I, the self, that flies into the heavens and links up with Osiris or Ray, the sun god. There is the higher I. But there is the Ba part of the soul, or Ka part of the soul, which stays here on earth and talks to relatives at the tomb where the soul or the person is buried. There's two aspects to the self, always. You find it in Judaism the divine infinite I, and then the little I am's made in the image of God. You find it in Christianity. Oops. You find it in Christianity where Christians talk about the first Adam in Genesis, the little I am. 
But the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, there is the last Adam, the larger I am. So all of these religions have within them this notion that I am not only a manifest probe on this little material earth, but the experiences I'm having here are relating to and being built into a higher self. And that self is conscious of this self. And this self will eventually become conscious of this higher self. But it may find out that that higher self has been many probes in a life, many lifetimes. And that at that point you might be able, again, don't believe a word I'm saying. This is all imaginal. But is it possible that when we move from this earth and this body decays and, and the, the molecules fall off, that higher self assimilates all the experiences of this little I into itself and there we get to have a conversation with all of our various selves. I first came across this idea in Shirley MacLaine's New Agey book, Out on a Limb. And I was an evangelical minister when I was reading this book and I read it wrapped in a brown paper bag <laughs> and hid it from my secretary because it was spiritual pornography. It's like I was reading stuff I shouldn't be reading and I got caught and almost got kicked out of the church. Now, the idea here, again, is there is a little I and a larger I. So here's a couple of images that show this. In Hinduism, Shiva, the dancing god, stands on a little tiny person. And that little tiny, there's many interpretations, but one is that out of the root or out of the seed of that little ego sprouts a divine being. You find the idea in Christianity, an image that very few people have seen, but it's all over paintings throughout the histories of the church. What do you notice at the bottom of the cross? Can you see it? A skull. This is a very common image in ancient Christian iconography. This is the last Adam. This is the little ego. The little ego is going to die and it's going to go to the grave. But the Christian idea was that out of that root or out of that seed of the little I am grows the great I am. There's two selves. So, oh, we, we don't have time to read these, but we could some other day. Now, the scientific evidence. There is an increasing research going on suggesting, and we've all heard the left brain, right brain, and there are many different applications of this, but one application of this is that this idea of the little I am exists in the left brain that basically is analytical, it's logical, precise, repetitive, organized, detailed, scientific, detached, literal, sequential, sensory-based, visible truth, temporal, spatial, is basically what we are right now in this room. And most of the week, we're moving along. And it's suggesting that the left brain mediates that kind of consciousness. But there's evidence that the right brain mediates what Andrew Newberg, Dr. Newberg, who is a neurotheologian, he's a neurologist, but he's studying religion and neurology, suggests that the right side of the brain mediates creativity, imagination, general ideas, intuitive experiences, conceptual, big picture, e heuristic or educational, empath uh, uh, empathetic, figurative, irregular ideas. Imagely based, it's based in the imagination. Uh-oh, I just screwed up the screen. Can you move it for me? Yeah. Finish out those lines there. That this right side of the brain is in... Back up. <laughs> See, we're working with the little ego here. <laughs> and my little ego gets pissed when shit goes wrong. So... Uh, and I know none of you is like that. But here, it's a good example because when I get upset, there is a little voice in the back of my mind that says... Help me here. Rest. Rest. It's not that big a deal. You don't understand. It's not that big a deal. Two minds. So this idea is, according to Newberg, where the mystical experiences come from, where the dream life happens. It helps explain dreams because it suggests that the little ego wants its world neat and ordered where everything is in its place and titled and, and regulated and everything's working the way it's supposed to 
down to the last detail. But the right side of the brain takes over when we go to sleep and the little ego, the little dwarf under Shiva's foot goes to sleep and the dream world of imagination pours in like an avalanche and says, here's what's really going on around you. Really? Here are all the different things that could have happened or maybe have happened or maybe will happen. There's no way we know what these dreams mean, but it suggests that there is, Newberg says, it suggests that the right brain opens out into the world of the invisibles. Move the slide, please. Put, a, put it all up there if you would. Here's a quote from Newberg. Um, can you take the little winged thing off? There, thank you. In his book, Why God Won't Go Away, and I highly recommend if you're interested in this topic, you write it down and read this book. It's written in lay terms very clearly. But in the research, it shows the different parts of the brain work like a saloon door. What's a saloon door do? It opens both ways. And he's suggesting that the research studying Buddhist and, and Christian mystics that the brain, when it operates through the senses, the little I am, lights up in certain areas. But when a person meditates or dances or drums or chants or prays or goes to a Pentecostal church service and sways and sings or the whirling dervish, you understand all these things that people do in the spiritual context, that, that dar or the, the light part of the little I am brain starts to cool. And as it cools, the saloon door is open out or away from the material world and into the mystical world. And the critics say, well, that just proves mysticism is all in your brain, in your head. And Newberg says, well, it also proves that the sensible world, the material world, is also all in your head. He said what it really proves is, or not proves, but it suggests is that there are two realities going on simultaneously for all of us. That one is this physical reality, and most of us, our senses are so activated all day long, that's all we really know, especially in this culture where everybody's whizzing past you in their little probes on the freeway. <laughs> and life is doing what it's doing with the television on all the time and the computer on all the time and tweeting and twitting and nitwitting and all this different stuff that we are so inundated by this, this world, the little ego, that the higher ego is never quiet long enough to come through and say, rest, rest, take some time, shut the hell up, go sit for a while, go to a service, go do something, meditate, do something, and open the I am so it can speak to the little I am and say, rest. Someday, little probe, you're going to come back and we're going to talk about all those soul-making experiences you had on that earth as a little probe gathering experiences. What if, what if that's true? I'm out of time, but I want you to go, if you would, just keep moving through. There's the saloon door idea. You see the brain image here, the wings on one side, the mystical brain, the larger eye, smaller eye. Keep moving through that slide to the next one, please. Keep going. Right here. I want you to see this little, see that little flame there that just came in? This is a, a Hindu image. I'm not teaching reincarnation here. That's another class, the possibility of it in Christianity as well as the East. But this... Uh-oh, my little flame moved. <laughs> Put the little flame back at the, there. What if that is the larger eye? And that, that eye moves through every stage of our life and maybe lives beyond this life. That that is the higher I am. That is the self, the higher self that knows and is becoming through our probing. Do you understand? It puts this little ego life in perspective and says, there's going to be trauma. We li we're living in an age right now, which I think is very fascinating, because we, many of us think that we can create a trauma-free world. Maybe we can. And I'm not saying we shouldn't try. But I'm just suggesting that possibly, possibly, 
that the nature of our probing in this world of dukkha, the cart losing its wheel, is part of the probe's experience because in order for that soul to become huge and amazing, it has to go through the good, the bad, and the ugly. Move on to the next slide and I'll close. This is Thomas Reed in his book, Essays on the Intellectual Powers of Man. And it sort of sums up what I'm saying here. He says, my thoughts, and I'm asking you to try this on, my thoughts and actions and feelings change every moment. They have no permanent existence, but they indicate a dynamic process of moving toward some goal. Next. The self, or I, says Reed, to which each thought and action and feeling belong is permanent and has the same relation to all succeeding thoughts, actions, and feelings, which I call mine. Last line. Such are the notions that I have of my personal identity. Let's just do a quick meditation here, a little quick prayer as we close. Again, I begin this by saying, don't believe a thing I have just said. Fortunately, we are a group of people who can come together and explore the imagination and ideas and try them on. I personally, this is a prayer that I have been using a lot lately infinite creator, my God. Help me, little Michael, especially in those times when I'm falling apart and I'm in, in, in a state of chaos and despair, to hear and to see and to know the higher self, that I am a probe. I'm going to seek the best fun I can have as this probe but stuff happens. And I trust that there is something bigger going on through every single one of these experiences that one day will be revealed in the I that is that higher self who sent this probe to earth. Take a breath. And so it is. And don't believe a word I said. One
One I never expected Rising up from misunderstood Well, I've, I've seen the road at ground level yeah. There's a wider view at play There's a much wider view Good morning. I am Dorothy Bostetter. I have been following New Thought for over 20 years, and I've been here at Unity of Bellevue for about four and a half. Uh, I come to Unity for one reason and one reason only, and that is to be reminded in community. The wheel fell off my cart Friday night, Friday morning at 10 a.m., two days ago and I have been ready to quit. Quit everything, seriously quit. And I knew when I came here today that I would be reminded why these things are happening and why I'm really here, both at Unity and on the planet. So thank you, Michael. Please teach the class. Please teach the class. Remembering and knowing and embracing the fact that we are here in community to remember and we are all in this together. It takes all of us to bring this community together and to support it each and every week. We are so blessed to be here and we are blessed by all that we've been given. And I invite you to take the gift of your abundance into your heart and bless the center to keep it vibrant and so we can keep remembering together who we are each and every week. I would like to invite those of you in the building with me, and those of you online, to hold your gift in your heart. For those of you who are here, there is a basket for your gift and love offering in the back. There are ways to give online. For those of you who are joining us outside of this building, thank you for being here, all of you. With the gift of abundance and blessing in your mind and heart, please join me in our offering affirmation. Divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive, and so it is. We give thanks for all these love offerings. We give thanks for all the blessings we have received. We know that all we are is called to serve the highest and the best for one and all. And so we dedicate these gifts for the spiritual service, invoking the law of circulation, that as we give, so we receive. We offer blessings upon blessings to the earth the divine gift which we channel all good things. We are so grateful, and so it is.
Good morning again. I have some announcements to share with you this morning. First of all, if you are visiting with uh, Unity of Bellevue for the first time, welcome. We open our hearts to you. We are so grateful you are visiting with us in person and online. If you go to our website, unityofbellevue.org, if you're online, you can go to the I'm New page and uh, check things out there. You can um, click on the button for a welcome packet to be sent to you. If you're here in person, there's a welcome packet just to the left after you enter uh, exit the sanctuary doors. And inside is a coupon you can take to the bookstore for 20% off any gift of your choice. Uh, there's also a connection card that you can fill out. They're in the back of the uh, seats and also in the welcome packet. We'd love to hear from you. The prayer chaplains are here to pray with you. Jennifer Holt is our prayer chaplain today. She will be in the library after service to pray um, in affirmative prayer together. Also, the prayer chaplains want you to know that if you would like one-on-one -on -one prayer, they also offer that. If you are wanting to join online, there is a Zoom link on our launch page to join that prayer circle. And uh, today is... Um, Earth Sunday, and I'm going to call up Linda Hillesheim. She is going to read our uh, sustainability policy, and then uh, I'll continue on. So, if you want to, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. This policy was composed many years ago when we had a very active green team and a number of people are still here and we still do practice all of these uh, elements of the policy as best we can. Our sustainability policy statement. Unity of Bellevue strives to demonstrate ecological stewardship through its decisions and choices in ways that promote sustainability. Sustainability means using natural, financial, and human resources in a responsible manner that meets existing needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Unity of Bellevue is pursuing, and has been, several efforts to make our church more sustainable. A sustainability policy encourages reducing waste, increasing recycling, conserving energy and water, using green building techniques, as well as practicing environmentally preferable purchasing. As a result of this policy, Unity of Bellevue will continually look for ways to reduce hazards and protect the environment, as well as directing financial resources toward more environmentally responsible alternatives. And thank you all for that. And we do have our cleanup day today, so we'll be stay, happy to see you. Stay right here, Linda. <laughs> stay right here. Today is our volunteer of the month, and it is Linda. Yay! <laughs> So just a little bit about Linda's uh, volunteer service. This is just a summary because there's, I, I could probably go on for a while, but Linda has uh, kept Unity of Bellevue decorated with beautiful floral arrangements for many years. And she is passionate about sustainability. She spends many hours a week taking care of our plants indoors and also serves on our landscaping committee, helping our flora thrive outdoors as well. She's also the coordinator of our Women Connect group, which is relaunching after a COVID break. And we are just blessed by all of the ways um, that um, Linda shares with us. She does a lot with social justice in our community, with the Interfaith, uh, Eastside Interfaith. She's on the board and keeps us connected with all of those groups that uh, that uh, board serves. Um, so we are so grateful for her presence amongst us and her service. And first of all, here's your little pin. <laughs> and here is a certificate of appreciation. And uh, let's just give her another round of applause. Thank you, Linda. Many, many years of service. And uh, we do have a help if you can day to day. Uh, if you are also, uh, so if you, if you're dressed appropriately, uh, stay after, and Linda can help you uh, find some some things to weed. I'm sure. Uh, also, we're also looking to sign up people for uh, sign up uh, signing up for a plot of your own to steward, uh, especially as we come into this wonderful growing season to keep to keep ahead of things. Uh, it's also uh, just uh, Volunteer Appreciation Sunday, the last Sunday of every month. So if you have volunteered at all during the month of April, if you would stand and online, we see you. 
uh, just stand and we will acknowledge all of our volunteers in every way, board, landscaping committee, ushers, greeters, thank you. It takes a village to run a village. <laughs> uh, be sure to check out uh, a class that's coming up next month, The Art of Quantum Living. That is being taught by Reverend Denise Schellink. She is the minister that we are um, entering into uh, contract negotiations with to be our, perhaps, uh, next transitional specialist or interim minister. So check out that class. It's online on our website. Uh, you can find out it's $125. And um, it's a great class to get to know her and to step into a next level, maybe the higher eye type of living, the quantum living. So look at that. Also, we have sent out our final survey the board has on our COVID-19 for masking and vaccination. You should have received an email. Uh, so if you didn't, let me know and I'll make sure you get that link. Uh, for those online, there is also a link posted in the chat. We're going to have uh, that uh, ending by Tuesday. So uh, just make sure you fill that out so we can get as many responses as possible. And then finally, just thank you again, Reverend Michael, for being here. We're so grateful. The right talk at the right time, always inspiring. And to Laura Berman, thank you, Laura. We are so grateful for her music uh, amongst us uh, and to everyone that's just here and being present. Um, it's really great to have, I know some of you are back for the first time and so um, thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to uh, be sung out uh, with Laura with the peace song, so please stand and uh, let's sing. us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed week. I got the power. You got the power. We got the power. I got the power. You got the power. We got the power. I've got the power, you got the power, we got the power. I've got the power, you got the power, we got the power. Every day I'm wasting
my time thinking that someone else is gonna do it all for me. I've got to get up, get out, get it, just get started. Take one step towards my destiny. I'll define my direction with clear cut intention. Declare what will be and then watch it come to me. Cause I've got the power to make all my dreams come true. I've got the power, there's nothing I can't do. No good Days when I don't even want to try But when I stop, look and listen 